and welcome back to iProperty Radio with myself, Carol Tallon. You can contact us on social media at iProperty Radio or email hello at iPropertyRadio.com. Following our LRD theme for this week, we'll continue our in-depth look at the arrangements for large-scale residential developments. And next, I'm chatting to Ian Murray, a Senior Director for Built Rent Consultancy Europe within Cortland Consult. And also, we'll be chatting to William O'Donnell, Into Engineering Associate Director. So, um, gentlemen, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. We've been learning from um, John Downey about the planning changes that are that are now that are now in place in Ireland. So, um, William, we might just head over to you first because we know that as part of this uh, these planning changes, there has actually been an update to the guidance for planning for daylight and sunlight analysis. So, you might just talk us through that element of the changes. Hi, uh, thank you, Carol. Um, yes, I suppose. I suppose one thing I suppose I'd like to kind of mention is this kind of the abstract notion, abstract notion of daylight and sunlight that people that kind of talk about and trying to equate it to something that people understand and realize. And we deal in kind of percentages, one percent or two percent. And in simple terms, what that means is that if you have kind of an apartment, um you get more light in. So ultimately what we're looking to do is design the best possible quality of residential space for a tenant. Um, and there's tricks and um, like shifting balconies, window sizes, all of these things, the massing of the buildings that had the impact on this. And we'll always work closely with the architects and the design team and with the, the, the clients themselves in order to ensure best quality in adherence with the guidance. So yes, uh, as you correctly say, the, the new guidance is out. So um, the BRE have a site layout planning for daylight and sunlight. And that's an easy title, but it does exactly what it says in the tin. So this document has been updated now, uh, just a, kind of in the last couple of weeks. So the it's a document by Paul Littlefair. Uh, and there's four other authors now this time around, which is Stephanie King, Garrett Howlett, Casimir Ticalano and Adam Longfield. So this guidance document has been updated. It's totally to do with the metrics that have been included in the new EN standard. So there's a new EN standard that was brought out in 2018. Um, so the issue that the, the daylight industry, for lack of a better word, um, and the designers have had with daylight over the last number of years, is the fact that there was a JOR on Atlantic Diamond, which set the cat among the pigeons. And then there was a legal interpretation of technical standards that went so far. And the great thing is people started getting their head around it. And as they got their head around it, we now have a new guidance set. So what we're gonna be talking about on the breakfast seminar is what's in this new guidance and how people can address it and understand it and that will not be scared of it. So there is an element that the BRE guide is a one-stop guidance document for these type of planning issues. It clearly states it's used for planning. It's used to help, you know, in the round. It's not a black and white document that needs to be this way or no way. It's there's other mitigating measures that are in all developments, and these need to be considered. So this document, I thought, in very simple terms, what's happening is anything relating to a new development. The methodology has changed. Instead of using the what's called average daylight factor and ADF, as people would have got very used to now and understanding, it has now moved to the EM standard where there are two options: is either median daylight factor or spatial daylight autonomy. So again, more acronyms, more complicated terminology that people are going to go, what does this mean? Why do I care? Why do I care? Because, you know, ultimately, hopefully we'll have better quality of developments. Um, and that's what most of the county councils are always pushing for. They're not being overly strange and saying we want, you know, 100% of the units to achieve compliance. They're saying, hey, 95% plus would be a really good target, especially if you're on a greenfield site. And the only thing that packs, impacts your, your own daylight is your own building. So if you can produce something that is reasonable, is cleanly addressed, you know, they appreciate that. And I, I mean, it's going to trickle down through the whole thing between the county council, the developer, ultimately better quality. And, you know, that's what people want. 
Um, um, and when you, you you touched on something, um, and sorry, and I don't I don't want to cut across you there, but you touched on something that is really symptomatic of um, changes in our in our planning regime over the past decade and a half, and that is as soon as as uh, the developers and the design teams uh, and those working within it get their head around it. Now there's a new methodology in place. How is that going to impact um, the plans that maybe developers and their design teams are currently working on? The guidance came out in 2018. So actually it came out at the same time as the apartment guidelines. Um, I suppose the BRE guide had been slated for update since about October last year, there was a draft going around last year that Dr. Pettifer had sent out and you know, people had, had comments back on it. Um, so this was, this was really telegraphed in, way, way in advance. So we all knew this was coming. So for the last maybe six, maybe eight months, we have been assessing majority of schemes under both metrics, the, the ADF and the new coming in spatial data lab autonomy. So I, I would kind of, I would hope and assume that any of any of the data consultants that I would would know that they've all been doing the same thing. They've they've known this was coming. They've been kind of belt and bracing approach to their developments in order to ensure you know good compliance and reasonable compliance with both. Now, I suppose very fundamentally, very important point out that there's not a massive fundamental difference between the two of them. So, um, in essence. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. So what was good for one is going to be good for the other. It's about getting daylight into space. There are some nuances. So the the previous metric was based on average daylight. So for an average, you can have a high, very high value and a very low value, and you hit your average. But for median value, is that fifty percent of the space has to achieve a certain value. So you can't have a very high spot and a very dark spot because you actually won't hit your median. So ultimately what that's looking to do is make it better again and say that you have more light within your space, more uniformity. You just don't have this very bright hot spot at the top of your room. Okay. It's a more yeah. quality. William, as, as an expert in this area, is this another box ticking exercise or will this actually make developments better for those within it? Personally, I lived in a north facing unit with a balcony above my KLD for 10 years and moved into the house with sunlight and you know I take give me great pleasure to have a scheme that's doing poorly to go through the the, the metrics with a developer or and a client and a design team and come out with something that's doing really well because I fundamentally and I know hand on heart that you know when people go into it it's going to be brighter it's going to be lighter it's going to be a nicer place to live I think the level of quality that is in this uh, is very important in terms of it's not just a box ticking exercise now. There is a fundamental improvement that is an output of any of our analysis. Yeah. I, I, and that's, that always has to be, you know, that should be a key driver of policy. But unfortunately, it isn't always. And this is probably a very good time to bring in Ian Murray, who is uh, excuse me, the senior director for Built Around Consultancy um, across Europe with Cortland Consult. Ian, I, I am, obviously you've been on the show before and we talk about um, the living standard, uh, standards within built rent developments. And so it, it's always about making things better for the occupants inside. Um, how do you see the changes and moving from the, from the SHDs to the um, large scale residential developments, the LRDs, do you see this as positive for the occupiers? Because they're always your priority in this. It's, um, I mean, I think as far as the planning regime is concerned, and uh, thanks for having me on the show again, uh, pleasure to be here. Um, I mean, as far as the planning regime is concerned, it's uh, that that are just that's just a set of rules that we have to follow. So, you know, I actually don't really care if it's SHD or it's LRD or if it's you can call it another acronym. As far as I'm concerned, uh, what I am concerned about doing is producing the best possible facilities for people to live in so that they can enjoy you know where they live with you know to the maximum uh, you know possible potential because you know the better the product that i put together with my clients in my own business then 
you know, the more likely people are to stay. And to William's point, in some respects, the, the daylight is extremely important. I mean, it's very important when somebody comes to view an apartment that they get the sense of space and the sense of light. But, you know, viewing an apartment is only a one speck of time. Actually, as people live in it, if there's something they don't like, they will move. So daylight is a fairly critical factor. And if you find yourself in an apartment that is constantly dull and a little bit you know in the wrong aspect in the wrong kind of light quality then your choices as a renter is that I can go and find another apartment that, I, that, it, that has better quality so from our perspective we're just trying to make sure that you know our design teams and advisors put together a product that is appealing from every aspect. And um, Ian, Ireland, as, as I'm sure you well know, does not have a great reputation, uh, certainly in past decades, for the design of our apartments. Um, you're offering advisory services across uh, Europe, Ireland, and right across, uh, across mainland Europe, uh, but across Ireland, the UK as well. Um, where is Ireland, in terms of our contemporary buildings, where are we fitting? Are we average? Um, or are, are we still lagging behind in terms of design and the offering to the private sector? So, I, I mean, I wouldn't put Ireland at the bottom of the tree and somewhere else at the top. To be honest with you, I think if you look across the board, residential development for sale has always been a certain product type. It's been, you know, a product that the developer wants to get, you know, the maximum return at the point of sale. So they will put in as much as they think they need to in order to, um, to satisfy a buyer. But once that buyer hands over the cash, they're off, apart from a, 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 you know, a, a, a set of, you know, perhaps some guarantees and some products and such like. It's very, very different in the professionally rented market. I hand over the keys to you and you need to be happy living in my product for as long as you're there. And if you're unhappy in any way, you just hand the keys back to me and go and rent somewhere else. So actually the quality of the rental product, as far as I'm concerned, is better than the residential for sale traditionally has been. So if I take kitchens, for instance, you know, kitchens can look great, but be badly built underneath and it, they will not last if they are not well specified. Now, we spend a lot of time specifying a high quality kitchen with high quality fittings, surfaces that are going to last a long time and appliances that have got good guarantees and are, and are reliable. Because we know that three or four years down the line, it still needs to perform at its top level. If I'm a for sale developer and, you know, don't get me wrong, there are quality levels that's in the sales market that go from bottom to top. But generally, I'm not that bothered if your kitchen starts to fall apart in five or six years time because, you know, the it, my, my responsibility in that regard has gone. In rental, my responsibility for the performance of the entire product from the moment you walk in the front door, go up the lift into your apartment, into the amenity spaces, I have the responsibility all the time. And the ownership remains within one ownership. So you have a single landlord to, to interface with. So your communications are, you can come directly to me and complain to me. And if I don't fix it or sort it, then you will be you know, unhappy and move on. Is that part of the mind shift that needs to change? Now, by the way, I, I would absolutely um, defend developers here that most of them actually would be concerned about their legacy. So even when they're um, developing to sell, they want something good. And to be fair, um, the good developers in Ireland have been very good at placemaking. Unfortunately, the bad ones have been very bad. And there's a huge gulf between the two. Um, but it is important to say that actually, historically, uh, and we call them developers, but actually historically local home builders in Ireland were very good at placemaking and thinking about it. But but I accept you're absolutely right. There's a mind shift change that needs to change across the development community when they're thinking about um, the life cycle of a project. But that comes back to, um, again, not offering something at the point of sale, but knowing that you're going to be maintaining it throughout. And that does come down to keeping the tenants happy. Do we know what tenants want? Yes, we do. Um, so I think if you'd asked me that question maybe seven or eight years ago, we'd be guessing because in the European market, there wasn't a particularly mature um, rental market under single ownership. That's what, what we would call multifamily PRS built to rent. It goes under several nom de plumes. The US market is massive. Our own business in the US is over 80,000 apartments or homes. 
uh, look over 150,000 residents. So we know to the kind of nth degree what they want. And, and in fact, in the, in the US, the, um, the, the body that sort of looks over multifamily can literally tell you to the penny what somebody will pay for a hard surface kitchen counter versus a, 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 a standard one. Now, we now have evidence within the markets in, in Europe, particularly in the UK and, and emerging in Ireland, of what renters are actually saying that they will, they do like and what they want. Now, there's a business in the UK called Home Views. It, um, it uh, uh, takes a, a analysis on, and um, surveys of all of its renters anonymously. It then produces a report that gives an, an actual critical factor and, and measurement of what it is that people are, uh, are looking for right from you know the amenities the events you know the interactions the communications um, and ESG. Then, then does that mean am i asking the wrong question is it not a case of what tenants want then is it a case of understanding what they're willing to pay for so i think there's there is this conception that um what, what you do is you just create a long list and you put an extra price against everything on on the list which i think is a misconception I mean, when we talk about disrupting the rental market, we're disrupting it from a PRS market, which is a basically a buy-to-let landlord market. So an absent landlord rented to you through an estate agent. And if something goes wrong, there's a convoluted communications process. Built to rent, professionally managed built to rent is very different from that. Now, we have a whole set of things that we measure. And I think at the end of the day, amenity is one of them. There are, fast broadband speed, telecommunications, app-based um, communications, you know, keyless door entry systems, the list is long and endless. And the quality of development is that I would say as a vanilla standard, all built to rent has at least most of this stuff baked in. Where it differentiates itself massively is in the customer service provision. And that is really where the built to rent sector is focused. I mean, there is a bit of a misconception that it's all about the capital expenditure and the build cost and the rental income. People do not continue to rent at the levels that you ask them to if they are not satisfied that the services and the communication and the customer service they receive is at the top level. Uh, and that's a really great point because as a renter, you're in a position to be much more responsive than a new homeowner that signed into a 25 or 30 year, 30 year mortgage. Um, so Ian, you will be speaking at this LRD seminar that's taking place this Thursday um, in, in Dublin. Um, it's an early morning one and we'll certainly put a link to the Eventbrite page on our website. What's the most important thing? What's the most important message you have for developers and their design team? Well, I, I mean, at the end of the day, we're really just interested in producing a phenomenal product that, um, that we can, you know, people will want to rent and that they will pay the appropriate rent level for the market and that we can own and operate at, you know, the most optimum level. And, and these are a very sort of key balancing equations. It's not just about capital expenditure. It's not just about operating costs and it's not just about life cycle. It's a blend of all three so we are really going to be talking about how best to blend all three to make sure that you get um, the best product. But one of the key takeaways that I really want people to kind of come away from on Thursday with is there has been a fundamental shift in the ESG side of the business and this long term whole life cost focus so that a building is environmentally energy aware, energy efficient, and will last a good period of time, that has shifted massively. And in fact, the rental market is probably going to be more akin to that than the development market for, for sale, again, because our responsibility lasts a lifetime. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting one. So I look forward to hearing more about that. And finally, William, before we wrap up, Again, what's the most important takeaway that you will be sharing with uh, developers, their design teams and the construction industry? Don't panic. So <laughs> things have moved, things have changed again, but it's okay. We can, we understand it. We know what the, the metrics are. We can do it. We can understand it. Don't panic.
I agree. You know, good, good advice in all circumstances. Well. <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, so my thanks to Ian Murray, Senior Director for Built Rent Consultancy Europe with Cortland Consult and to William O'Donnell, Associate Director with Into Engineering. And again, a reminder that that early morning LRG session will take place this Thursday, 30th of June, and you'll find information on the iProperty Radio website with a link to the Eventbrite page. We need to take a quick break now. Stay tuned. <laughs>